with another black curriculum video and I want to take a different approach on this one. So I got a question for you. Have you ever read an autobiography from a runaway slave? Well, if not, then I want to put you onto a book. This is called Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. That was a bit of a reading rainbow type of intro, but anyway, we're gonna get right into it. Many may know him as Frederick Douglass, but his real name was Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. But for the sake of this video, I'll continue to call him Frederick Douglass. He was born into slavery in Talbot County, Maryland. Now here's how I'll break down the contents of this autobiography. So here's how I'll break down the contents of this autobiography. I'll start by contrasting the life of Frederick Douglass with that of Booker T. Washington. I'll look at his youth and how he discovered the evils of slavery. And I'll look at how he became a free man and in between and how he went through the ups and downs of the idea of wanting to escape. I mean, that's a really taxing idea. Finally, I want to conclude by mentioning that he was not an exceptional man. Sounds crazy, but really follow me. This is sort of the theme of my video. So let's follow the steps and I'll get started. So yeah, Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. How are they similar and how are they different? Well, they are similar in a way that they were both born around, you know, the early 19th century. They both had a real strong connection with uh, the idea of slavery being involved in that. And they both had to look at their surroundings and escape from where they were. The difference is that Frederick Douglass, he's a runaway slave. Booker T. Washington, he was a man that uh, after the emancipation, he was a freed man. And he made the decision, Booker T., uh, Booker T. Washington, he made the decision to go from Franklin County, where he was born and raised, to Hampton, where he wanted to start his education and uh, prosper from there. Frederick Douglass, he wanted to go from Baltimore, Maryland to New York. So that was a longer trek. So you see some similarities and differences in their life. Both, both really, really pivotal though. Now again, in this autobiography, uh, Frederick Douglass recounts a lot of evils of slavery. I think this, to me, unraveling the evils of slavery for Frederick Douglass really affirmed his idea that yes, he needed to run away from this institutionalized slavery, this institutionalized evil, being separated from your family, not knowing your own age, the brutality, I mean many other things, but at the root of it, it really, really tears at every noble aspect of a human being. Oh yeah, and being equated as property and not human. So yes, he had to do something about this, and he started to see these evils of slavery when he was a very, very young man. Another key aspect that sort of acted as a catalyst for him to really hold on to the idea that yes, he needs to escape. He was a very young man, he saw his aunt being beaten. I mean, when you see that horror, I mean, it does something to your soul. And he really recounts this um, in his autobiography. I mean, he really puts us in the front row of this plantation, Colonel Lloyd's plantation to be exact. Now at the time, he was about seven, eight, a bit too young to do physical labor out in the field. So he had to do menial tasks like run errands for his master's daughter, keep the front yard clean and things like that. This is where things started to change for Frederick Douglass. He goes from Talbot County, Maryland, where he was born and raised, and he calls this transition a special interposition of divine providence. Now, it was in Baltimore where he got a chance to read. Mrs. Oud, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, she was a woman who helped him with his alphabet and spelling. He developed his writing skills by going to a shipyard and, and mimicking the, the copies of, of labels that he used to put on wood. Reading and writing, something that he felt was a pivotal tool in him equipping himself to become a free man. Now, throughout this autobiography, I mean, he did go through some ups and downs. I mean, there was a time when he was on cloud nine going to Baltimore, describing it as the, one of the happiest moments of his life, reading and writing, like I said earlier. And there were times where he was sent right back into the hands of a brutal, brutal slave owner named Mr. Kobe. And this was the first time where he was basically a uh, field hand. He was out in the field being beaten things like that, and that really, really took away that dream of him ever becoming a runaway slave. So how do you deal with these ups and downs? I mean, as a person reading this autobiography, knowing that he ran away, it's really refreshing uh, because one, I can relate to those, uh, those highs and lows, right, of life. And yes, I do believe that him being the only slave that went to Baltimore was a key, key aspect in him becoming a free man. And so let me conclude this video by justifying what I said earlier in the intro about him not being an exceptional man. A few days ago, I looked at a TED talk about a Muslim woman and her uh, sharing and, and, and uh, speech about her living in the United States. 
And she said something very interesting to me at the end of the video. She said that, that oftentimes when you meet someone who seems like an exception to the rule, it's the rule that's been broken and not the fact that they've been an exception to it. And so me doing the little fact checking and reading this autobiography through the lens of what this Muslim woman said, I gotta say that it checks out. I mean, he broke the rule of escaping this institutionalized slavery, something that everyone in power deemed to be right and normal and the way of life. And uh, that's how he got to be one of the black icons that we still celebrate and still revere as a man who was very noble and very brave in his life. What was very refreshing was that his actions made him an extraordinary man. It wasn't that he was born extraordinary. So when you look at these people like Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, I mean, they started by assessing the reality around them and they broke rules. Something that we can all do if we really focus and put our actions toward justice and uh, a better future. And real quick, I want to mention this topic of Christianity because Frederick Douglass mentions how he's connected and feels connection spiritually to that of Christianity, something that a lot of his slave owners, well not a lot, all of his slave owners identified with as well. Uh, and ironically enough, the Muslim woman, uh, she basically equates ISIS to that of the Ku Klux Klan, both priding themselves on the wretched acts and saying that their wretched acts are based on the Holy Bible. But if we really follow their narrative, then we believe that Islam is not valid and we believe that Christianity is not valid based on their acts and how they identify with the Holy Book. Well, in the case of Islam, the Quran, and with the case of Christianity, the Holy Bible. What the Muslim woman is saying and what Frederick Douglass is saying is that we should not look at their acts, their wretched acts of racism and hatred and evil, and say that this is the ultimate representation of the Holy Bible, or even their religion that they subscribe to. Instead, we should delve into spirituality and see for ourselves. I mean, this is that old school argument of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, being very dismissive about spirituality that you really don't identify with, but using your arguments and claims based on the actions of wretched men and women who identify with being Christian or Muslim. So yeah, that's my two cents on this autobiography. Again, the title is The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. So check it out and let me know what you think. This has been The Black Curriculum.